call. And so, Lord, as we look at this scripture written so long ago, once again, we pray that you would make it relevant for our day. May we truly see the God who has told us of the things that would come and have come to pass is the same God who has told us of the things that are to come in our future. And Lord, we are to have a certainty of their occurrence. And so once again, Father, we just pray that you would bless us this evening with the knowledge of your word, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You should turn and greet your neighbors. Go ahead and open your Bibles to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 20, we'll be picking up at verse 1. Book of Isaiah chapter 20, starting at verse 1. Keep in mind that the prophet Isaiah, who was definitely a prophet, obviously, but also the court historian, he's got the ear of the king. And so he's been ministering as of late to King Hezekiah, who was the son of King Ahaz. Ahaz was a most evil of kings. King Hezekiah is a man who sought after the Lord and the things of the Lord, and so he's being encouraged by the prophet. Isaiah chapter 20, once again starting at verse 1. It says, In the year that Tartan came to Ashdod, when Sargon the king of Assyria sent him, he fought against Ashdod and took it. At the same time, the Lord spoke by Isaiah the son of Amos, saying, Go and remove the sackcloth from your body and take your sandals off your feet. And he did so, walking naked and barefoot. Then the Lord said, Just as my servant Isaiah has walked naked and barefoot three years for a sign and a wonder against Egypt and Ethiopia, so shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptians as prisoners and the Ethiopians as captives, young and old, naked and barefoot, with their buttocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt. Then they shall be afraid and ashamed of Ethiopia, their expectation, and Egypt, their glory. And the inhabitant of this territory will say in that day, Surely such is our expectation wherever we flee for help to be delivered from the king of Assyria, and how shall we escape? So what we've been seeing in the last couple of chapters, and even still in the chapters to come, is that God is Lord not only of the nations, but of the ages as well. We know how this turns out. We're told in Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 through 11, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of of the Father. We see this very clearly today, and just by even being here, being involved in ministry, having a desire to hear from the Lord and from his word, that we bow ourselves before the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we've done, we've been saved. But sooner or later, all the world is going to bow. And the idea is you can bow now, you can bow later. Either way, you're going to bow. Today we bow to the Lord Jesus Christ again for the purpose of salvation, In the future, it's going to be in judgment. But nonetheless, the Lord, the Lord is God over all. He has his hands upon all of the events that occur within our society. (coughs) Ever since the announcement that was made on Friday concerning gay marriage and all, just felt this spiritual repression. Just this kind of dark spiritual blanket over, well, just over me, whatever. I was thinking about that yesterday and just... You know, you can even get to the point thinking, well, we lost. But we haven't. Jesus Christ is still seated upon the throne. And the same God that was moving back then in Isaiah's day, and it's the purpose why we studied the book of Isaiah or any Old Testament book, so that we know the same God is still ministering today. God isn't defeated. There's no human court that can defeat God. Matter of fact, God will prevail over all. And so that being the case, have to be reminded from time to time We are more than conquerors in the Lord Jesus Christ, meaning we fight from the standpoint of victory. When I say fight, we push on in the scriptures from the standpoint just as if we have already emerged victorious. Why? Because, and we talked about this this morning with the teachers, Revelation chapter 5, because Jesus prevailed. Where did he prevail? He prevailed upon the cross, and then he prevailed over death, and he's raised and seated at the right hand of the Father. 
So we know that all nations will bow to him in the last days, but even throughout the course of history, they are being directed by his will. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we were given a timestamp of a certain point in history in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 28. It says, this is the burden which came in the year that King Ahaz died. So the Bible and the history book tell us that after Ahaz died, again, his son Hezekiah took the throne of Judah. Now, just in way of remembrance, the kingdom of Israel is divided at this time. There's the northern ten tribes and the southern two tribes of Benjamin and Judah. King Ahaz is over those two southern tribes, which that area is called Judah. And then there's the northern ten tribes that is referred to in this point of history as Israel. It was a very turbulent time, just as we read the news and hear about ISIS. And it doesn't seem like anybody can stand up against ISIS. It doesn't seem like anybody is stopping ISIS or even making the effort, really, to, to come up against ISIS. ISIS is attacking these, these cities, and thousands of Iraqis are fleeing only against just a, a handful of, of ISIS warriors. And you can look at this and think, what in the world's going on? Well, it was the same thing with Assyria back in the day. Back in Hezekiah's day, Assyria, Assyria was consuming nations one right after another. But it was God's will. Because again, you have this new king, young man in his 20s. He doesn't know what to do. His father at one point in history made a deal with Assyria, and so he could consider that. Or he could consider some of the surrounding nations, and that's what we've been looking at, these various nations, and that he could make a deal or an alliance with some of these other strong nations, and they could come up against Assyria. But that's not what the will of God is. Again, God has his spokesperson in the palace because God wants to direct the heart of the king. And he's telling the king that he is not to depend upon any of the surrounding nations, that his dependency would be on the Lord. And so he would develop a relationship with God, and he would depend upon that God. It's the same thing he tells you. It's the same thing that he tells me. Because we see these things that are going on. We experience the hardship of life and all of these things. And God's just wanting not only to start a relationship, but to develop a relationship, to build a relationship, and that the relationship would result in a dependency upon God for all that we need and for all that we are. We must ally ourselves back with God even today, the church, as we see the attack coming. What do I mean by ally back? I think we've wandered off as a church, not just Calvary Chapel, Ontario, but the church in general. We need to sharpen our spiritual senses back towards the Lord, not just praying just to offer up a prayer, but to truly come and entreat the Lord, to seek after God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our minds, to understand that when we're praying, we're not just offering words up into the air, but when we're praying that we would focus our mind and understand that we are praying to God Almighty, creator of the universe, and be of the mindset that we're not just getting this chance to talk at him, but he is listening to us. Because the Bible tells me if I ask anything in his name, he hears me. And then understand what a privilege that is that God desires to hear my prayer. And we've seen the scriptures, again, Revelation chapter 5, it's as if God keeps them all and it's a sweet-smelling aroma to him. It is something very pleasurable to him. And so I can think, well, I don't want to bother him or why would he think about me? But he does. Remember in Jeremiah, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil to give you a future and a hope. Well, the thing that should amaze you is that God thinks about you. God thinks about you. I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Now, he's saying that to Judah as they're in Babylonian captivity, as they have turned their back from God and God has brought them into captivity and God is still saying, I know the thoughts that I think towards you because they're thinking it's over. God, God must hate us now. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil. Why? Because it's God's desire to give them a future and a hope. And even in the current economy that we live in now, God knows the thoughts that he thinks towards you, thoughts of peace and not evil. Now, thoughts of peace, this is peace of God towards you, not thoughts of evil of God towards you. Now, the world's still going to be evil. There's going to be evil going on all around us. But that's the peace of God that surpasses understanding. 
thoughts of peace and not evil. Why, Lord? To give you a future and a hope so that you would not be dismayed, so that your spirit would not be broken in this present age, but that you would understand and you would realize, regardless of what's going on in your life, that God has a future and a hope for you. And we're going to see Hezekiah a little bit later on when Assyria does come up against Judah and everything seems lost, everything seems done, and just almost overnight, not almost, overnight, God delivers them and God does a supernatural work in their lives. And it's the same thing that God is able to do in your life, and it's the same thing that God wants to do in my life. The problem is it's a hard lesson because it all depends upon faith. Not to have faith that he's going to do it, but faith in the midst of what God is doing and trusting in God in the process of what he's doing. Because at times, again, we can look around and we can see that it's just not going to happen. But God continues to do the supernatural. God continues to do the good work to the same degree today as he did back in the day, back in Isaiah's day and back in every other day that we read in the scriptures. So what God has been doing, again, is giving us a history lesson before the history occurs as far as the fate of these nations who Hezekiah could consider to make alliances with. So in the last couple of weeks, we saw the fate of Philistia. Hezekiah, don't make alliances with the Philistines because they were attacked by Assyria in 722 B.C. And in 711 B.C., they were completely destroyed, never to be heard from again. Moab, don't make alliances with Moab because Moab was sacked in 715 B.C. Don't look to us, or, or I keep getting these mixed up. Assyria is doing the attacking. Don't look to Syria or Damascus because Damascus fell to the Assyrians in 732 B.C. Don't look even to your brothers to the north, Samaria, because Samaria fell in 722 B.C. And then Egypt, just in case you're thinking about Egypt, and Ethiopia is going to be brought in with that, but Egypt fell in 672 B.C. They were conquered by Assyria. All of these nations were not just defeated, but they were basically destroyed and brought to third-class nations. Egypt will once again have a bit of a glory day, but again, never to the degree that it had in the past. As God has allowed these things to happen, he has done so so that Israel, so that we would look back and see these mighty nations, but see how these mighty nations are brought down to the ground and see the most humble of nations, Israel, how God has kept it throughout all of the years. I've mentioned it this morning. I've said it many times before. When I start doubting the existence of God, I just have to look to Israel. Because as my wife and I were there, I was just so taken back how small of a nation it is. We hear about the missiles and all of that. You don't need missiles to attack Israel. Just the World War II artillery would be able to be fired into Israel from the surrounding nations. And if you Wikipedia Israel or Israeli wars, you can see that, well, 1948, soon after being established by a nation, they were attacked. 1967, they were attacked by the surrounding nations. 1972, and each war, it looked like this is going to be it for Israel, but the hand of God moved in a miraculous way, and Israel has been kept. Israel has persevered. Now, as we read the Bible, we know that Israel is going to last all the way through into the final days. So never again is it going to be defeated. And so you hear all the saber rattling from Iraq and whatnot. It doesn't matter. They're not going to be able to do anything apart from God. Now, there is going to be another great battle that occurs in Israel. We see this in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 38. We may be here for that as far as the church. We may not be here for that. But nonetheless, God still has his hand upon all of these occurrences that are going on, and it should give us a surety, because that's what God wanted to do, is to set his glory upon Israel. As you would look at Israel that you would see the hand of God upon Israel. Unfortunately, the Israelis should look at themselves and see the hand of God upon them, although Israel is a very secular state today. But nonetheless, I look at Israel, and I see the mighty hand of God that's able to keep them, and that gives me hope that just as surely as God is able to keep Israel, God's able to keep Mike. God's able to keep Calvary Chapel, Ontario. God's able to keep whatever it is that we entrust into his hands. 
So God, through the prophet Isaiah, tells these things to the king, King Hezekiah, so that he would know, and remember, there's a lot of gods back then, a lot of gods today, a lot of gods who aren't really God, but Isaiah would know that his God is truly God. His God is the God that is, going back to Moses. I am. Tell him I am sent me, because all the other gods, they really weren't. And again, we can look at that today. Our God is truly the God who is, because Jesus said as he established his church, he will keep the church until the day of Jesus Christ. In Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 through 10, it says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. He's telling us, Calvary Chapel, Ontario, these things, so that we would know the same God who held the history of the past in his hand holds our history, the history of our future in his hand as well. Just as surely as we could look back and see past prophecies and how they came to pass, we can look forward to the future prophecies with a surety to understand and know that those will come to pass as well. Ladies, you are going to be studying the book of Daniel this coming year. It's going to be very rich. You're going to see history that is laid out almost as if it had already happened in that book. Considering uh, Antiochus Epiphanes and Israel and the Maccabees and all of this history that happened hundreds of years after it was prophesied by Daniel. Matter of fact, there's chapters in the book of Daniel that a lot of scholars, secular scholars, do not believe that it was written by Daniel because it was so historic, historically accurate hundreds of years again before it happened. And so again, that same God that spoke of the events that were going to happen before they did is the same God that we depend upon in these most evil times as we see things getting more evil and more evil, understanding, well, God said it was going to be this way. Matter of fact, Jesus pointed out and he said, what did he tell you to do? He told you to watch, watch. Because as we see these things happening, we know that we're getting towards the end. But that's a good thing because we also know that God's in control. And so that he was accurate 100% of the time of the prophecies of the past, he will be accurate 100% of the time in the prophecies of our future. In Psalm chapter 2, verses 8 through 9, the father says to the son, Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. And so all that we experience... It's all about the process. This is God's process, but it's a process we have to understand of grace. Now, God gave great promises in Genesis chapter 15. Speaking of Moses, I'm sorry, not Moses, speaking of Abraham, it says in verse 12, Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. And he said to Abraham, God said to Abraham, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them, and they will afflict them for 400 years. He's speaking of a prophecy to Abraham of their Egyptian captivity. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Well, we know that because of the plagues that came up against them and even what we're reading about today. Afterwards, they shall come out with great possessions. And that came to pass as we read through Exodus. Now, as for you, you shall go down to your fathers in peace. Yep, this all happened after Abraham died. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So in this, we see the grace of God as well. The Amorites were inhabitants of the promised land. The iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Well, judging by what I see here, God gave them 400 years to repent until he brought I'm sorry, Israel into the promised land to conquer them and to destroy them. He gave them 400 years to repent. How did he do that? I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But I know how God works and operates. He usually sends a prophet. We don't have all of the prophets. We have all the prophecies that are necessary for our life, but we don't necessarily have all the prophets are contained in the scriptures. And so I truly believe 
and you can take it or leave it, that God sent prophets into the promised land, but they refused the prophets. He gave them 400 years to repent. They didn't, and then God brought his people in in order to bring judgment. Now Hezekiah, the idea here as we continue on into chapter 20, it's as if Isaiah is speaking to him, understand the end of the world powers. So the first thing that we're going to see is the invasion. Verse 1. In the year that Tartan came to Ashdod, when Sargon, the king of Assyria, sent him, and he fought against Ashdod and took it. Once again, we have a time stamp. Time stamp, just as surely as we did when King Ahaz died, we have the time stamp of when Ashdod fell. The time focus is during that time when Assyria besieged and sacked Ashdod. Tartan, he was a general of this king of Assyria, and apparently he was commissioned to go and take this city. Ashdod was originally a Canaanite city that was never really conquered or kept by Israel. It's in nation Israel. It's to the, if you know where Jerusalem is on the map, it's to the west towards the Mediterranean and south a little bit. It was originally, again, a Canaanite city that was never really conquered and kept by Israel. Upon their entry into the Promised Land, the city was inhabited by Anakims, or giants, and the Philistines eventually conquered it and inhabited. If it sounds familiar, it was the place, the scene of the battle of the gods. Israel was fighting the Philistines and wasn't going so well, and so the Israelites, who at this time weren't honoring God by their, or through their hearts or by their manner of living, they weren't doing well against the Philistines, so they decided to go back and get the ark. They went back and got the ark, and they were kind of using it as a good luck charm. They went off into battle against the Philistines, and the Philistines conquered them, and they took, the Philistines took, possession of the ark. And then in 1 Samuel chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. Dagon was kind of like a fish man god kind of a thing. So this was the temple of Dagon, of, of their god. Now the idea for the Philistine mind is our god conquered your god. Verse 3, And when the people of Ashdod arose early in the morning, there was Dagon falling on, fallen on its face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set it in its place again. It's kind of a bummer when your king, I mean your god falls over and he's laying flat on his face and you have to help your god rather than your god helping you. Verse 4, and when they arose early the next morning, there was Dagon fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. The head of Dagon and both palms of his hands were broken off on the threshold. Only Dagon's torso was left of it. It's kind of a bummer when your God loses his head and his hands, can't do anything for himself and can't think for himself anymore. Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon nor any who come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod to this day. But the hand of the Lord was heavy upon the people of Ashdod. Ashdod at that point was learning who the true God really was. And if you know the story, they finally returned the ark back to Israel, the Israelites. Now through the course of history, Ashdod became kind of a pawn city in the war between Assyria and Egypt. It was kind of halfway in between on the road if you would be traveling from modern-day Iraq through to attack uh, um, Egypt. And so it was on the path, and so it kind of changed hands quite a few times. Keep in mind, though, Ashdod, Ashdod was really never really long for this world. It was on God's historical hit list. In Amos chapter 1, verse 8, it says this prophecy against Ashdod, I will cut off the inhabitant from Ashdod and the one who holds the scepter from Ashkelon. I will turn my hand against Ekron, and the remnant of the Philistines shall perish, says the Lord. So here Ashdod is being used to validate a time in which he will bring judgment upon the, the mighty North African countries. So we see the invasion. Now we see God's instruction, verse 2. At the same time, the Lord spoke by Isaiah, the son of Amoz, saying, Go and remove the sackcloth from your body and take your sandals off your feet. And he did so, walking naked and barefoot. Now, when God gives a prophecy, he does so in a very public and upfront 
manner. God lays it all out on the line. God lays it all out on the line so that there's, there, there's nothing that is vague about his prophecies. He's wanting everybody to listen to Isaiah. We'll get into Isaiah's manner of dress here in a little bit. But the idea is to get people's attention, not so that they look upon Isaiah, probably not a pretty sight, but so that they listen to what he has to say. Because again, what he has to say, they understand he's a prophet, they understand that he's delivering a message from God. And so again, we should be able to do the same thing. Look in the history and see. God said Israel was going to be established. You see it in Romans chapter 11. We studied in our Wednesday morning men's study last week. And then 1948, May of 1948, Israel is reestablished. He said there's going to be a rapture. Now, with all the prophecies that have come to pass, and God said there's going to be a rapture, I believe there's going to be a rapture. He's batting a thousand in my book. Tribulation, he says there's going to be a great worldwide tribulation that is going to be cataclysmic and is going to last for seven years. And so I accept that with a surety. A second coming of Christ, just as surely as he came the first time and he was prophesied that he was going to come, he's prophesied that he's going to come a second time. There's a surety about that in my mind. There's going to be a thousand-year millennial rule reign. And so just as God said it's going to happen, I believe it's going to happen. Then there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth because the old will be done away with. And so everything that we see now, you've heard the expression, it's going to burn it's going to burn to its very core so that we would understand and know our priorities are not in the temporary thing here of this world, but the eternal things of the Lord. <clears throat> and then we are told all of those who are of the Lord Jesus Christ will live with God for eternity in his presence. And I hold those things and the truthfulness of those things as if those things have already happened. Why do I base it? Well, I base it first because I believe the word of God is breathed by God. And I also see that God has never been wrong. If God's wrong even once, then God's not really God. Or if his word is wrong even once, then it's not really accurate. But as of today, nobody's been able to prove otherwise. Now, what kind of faith do you have in what God says and what God instructs you to do? What if God gave you such an instruction? Take your sandals off your feet, and he did, and take the sackcloth off your body. And you walk barefoot and naked. Are you able, are you willing to do the hard things in the sight of the world for his glory? What does it all boil down to? It all boils down to faith in God's word. This had to be a hard thing for him to do. Honestly, a hard thing for him to do. It's not, we, we look at faith, and, and it's been misdefined in so many ways, and I'm not going to get into a whole study on faith, but you might look at somebody having more faith than you or you not having enough faith or needing more. It's never about how much faith you have. It's always about you just simply having faith and not faith for faith's sake, but faith in something or someone, in this particular case, obviously, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Is all you need is just to exhibit some sort of faith because God does great things with little faith. It's God who will magnify your faith and multiply your faith and so as all you have to do is exhibit faith towards God and matter of fact I really believe it's first step faith because if you have enough faith to take the first step and what you know that God has called you to do or I won't even put it that strongly what you believe that God has called you to do I guarantee you God will multiply your faith and he will strengthen you in his purposes but do you have an understanding of your God and whom you are having faith in? Because it's the Lord who is to be glorified. It's God who has the reason and purpose for our lives. And so again, I just need to exhibit little faith, but little faith towards a holy God. And I talked about it this morning. Are you a small God person? If you're God small, then you're not going to have a whole lot of faith at all, if any. If you're a big God person, then you're going to have faith, but not in what you're able to do, your little faith will be multiplied because you have faith in him who's able to do so much more than what you're able to do. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And so I want to be a person that pleases God. How do you please God? 
have faith in the things that you know, or at least you believe that God has directed you in. And again, God is not just going to lay the whole thing out for you. God is just going to give you the step-by-step process. You need to have faith to take those steps. You need to have faith when God says, well, you're not really going in the right direction. You need to go to the right or you need to go to the left and have faith in God that he's going to provide for you. There are two categorical types of people when it comes to faith within the body of Christ today. There are the professors of faith, those who profess faith, and there are the practitioners of faith. See, the church thinks that it so easily glorifies God through simple profession of faith, but that's just the beginning of faith. See, after that, it's got to be the practicing of faith because that's where true faith is seen. How many people have you talked to who are doing absolutely nothing for the Lord and say, well, I exhibited faith, I... And then they'll say they did something as far as making some sort of decision for Christ. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with making a decision for Christ, but my decision for Christ is validated through my practicing faith. If there is no faith that I am practicing, then I have to question, did I really make a profession of faith? Because a profession of faith will always result in practicing faith. I'm not saying you're just practicing, but I mean a living a life of faith in God and what God is able to do, and even more directly, what God is able to do through me for the purpose of his ministry. So I must be a professor of faith, but also it's got to be followed through with being a practitioner of faith. If you're not practicing your faith, you need to question your salvation. Do I need to go back, and do I need to do the most elementary things of salvation again? Isaiah, Isaiah exhibited great faith by following through God's instruction, even though it was something contrary to him. The illustration, thirdly, verse 3, actually verses 3 and 4. Then the Lord said, Just as my servant Isaiah has walked naked and barefoot three years for a sign and a wonder against Egypt and Ethiopia, so shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptians as prisoners and the Ethiopians as captivities, young and old, naked and barefoot, with their buttocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt. There, are, I, I, Going through, when I put a study together, I look at very com, very quite a few commentaries. I, I don't want to just go through scriptures and come up with I come up. I don't want to be wrong on anything. I try to check very opposing views and really understand and really know what the scriptures say. Usually I'll put a study together and I'll go back through and read the commentaries just to make sure that I'm on the right track. And I went and looked it up on this because I wanted to make sure I was telling you the proper thing. And there's a disagreement to how far disrobed Isaiah was. Now this is for three years that God told him to do this. Now, some say he wore a loincloth that he just took his outer garment off, and that's very possible. Others say that he wore absolutely nothing. Well, it was for the purpose of an illustration, and the illustration was illustrating the practice of the Assyrians as they would capture a nation. Now, the prophecies against these two mighty nations of northern Africa. The idea, Assyria is going to come in, they're going to conquer Egypt and Ethiopia, they're going to take them captive, and they're going to, as was their practice, to lead them away. How would Assyria do that? They would come in, conquer the people, they would kill the majority of them, the rest of them they would take captive, they would strip them completely of their clothing, they would put some kind of fish hook or something around their necks, tie them basically together, and they would parade them through their conquered nations as a warning that if you rebel this is what's going to happen to you and the idea is they would humiliate them and that's what we're being that's what is being spoken of here in the last part of verse four you're taking these captives young and old naked and barefoot and it's very clear here with their buttocks uncovered to the shame of egypt and so you've got isaiah this older man who's walking around either with no clothes on or not many clothes on. Now, next Sunday morning, if somebody walked in here in that manner of dress, they would probably get your attention. You would probably think, what in the world's going on with that? 
well, they know who this particular guy is. You know, there's Isaiah. What in the world is he doing? And then he's got this message. He's got your attention, and now he's got the message. He's got the message that was given by God. They recognize this man is a prophet, and so he's speaking the Lord and the things of the Lord. And he's got this visual illustration. If you're contemplating placing your trust not on God, but on Egypt and Ethiopia, this is what's going to happen, because this is what's going to happen to them. And just as Assyria uses as an example to the nations that they've conquered, God's using it as an example to the nation of Israel. If you don't trust on me, then you will find yourself the very same way. What happened to the northern kingdom of Israel when they were conquered? I think it was 722 B.C. That's what happened to them. They were, majority of them killed. The rest were taken captive. They were stripped, and they were taken away naked. They were taken away in their shame, and they were never to be as they were again. That's why the Jews so looked down upon Assyrians, I'm not Assyrians, um, Samaritans because they can never prove truly that they were true Jews. Now, you see nakedness here. Nakedness is a biblical sign of shame and sin. It's what Adam and Eve discovered at the moment of their sin. Again, remember what happened? They sinned, Genesis chapter 3, verse 7, and immediately their eyes were open. We're naked. Now, they're not just seeing outward signs of naked. We're, we're transparent. And really what they're seeing is they're seeing their sinful nature. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And again, I don't know how true this is. You know, what was the fruit that they ate? History tells us it was the apple, but Bible doesn't tell us it was the apple at all. It just doesn't say. I kind of think it makes sense to me. They sewed fig leaves together. I bet you they ate a fig. I bet you that tree that they weren't supposed to eat from was a fig. And there they are, because I know the feeling. They've got their sin now plastered all over them. And so... You know, there's God walking in the coolness of the day. Adam, where are you at? He knows exactly where he's at. He's hiding in the bushes, covered with fig leaves because he's sinned. He's discovered that he's naked. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he doesn't want God. <clears throat> he doesn't want God to see his shame, the shame of his nakedness. <clears throat> now, when the great white throne happens in Revelation chapter 20, all the world will stand before God naked. Now, I don't know if it's so much naked as far as no clothing, but I for sure know that it's going to be transparent. We are all going, not we, they, because if you're a born-again believer, you will not stand before the great white throne, but you will, they will all stand before God transparent. Their shame will be very apparent. Again, Romans chapter 3, verse 19, so that every ma mouth will be stopped. And just as truly as Adam tried to cover himself with fig leaves, man so tries to cover himself with his own righteousness through religion, through goodness, through good works. But nonetheless, the sin continues to shine through. Mankind has nothing sufficient to cover nakedness or to cover his sin. Hebrews 4.13, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Some commentators said it's even very possible that Jesus Christ died naked upon the cross. Why would he die naked upon the cross? Because he became sin. As for the born-again believer, we will not be found naked before God because what? We're covered. What are we covered with? We're covered with the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 through 9, Paul understanding this concept perfectly. Yet indeed, I also count all things a loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, because he knew that was nothing that would leave him naked, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. And then next, fourthly, we see the lost influence. Verse 5. Then they shall be afraid and ashamed of Ethiopia, their expectation, and Egypt, their glory. Those who King Hezekiah would depend upon for their abilities to withstand Assyria. Well, again, Ethiopia, their expectation. They had great expectations that through Ethiopia and its mighty army, that they would be able to stand against Assyria. 
Egypt their glory. It's Egypt that's going to, to keep us. But who's to be our expectation and glory? Our expectation is God. That's my great expectation is in the Lord Jesus Christ and that truly he will cover me in his, his righteousness. And then my glory, my glory is not in myself because I fail daily, but my glory is in God as well. And so God is, is, is trying to get this point across to this great king that don't depend upon these nations because these nations have absolutely nothing to offer you. This world has nothing to offer us. It's God in a relationship with the Lord is where we find, it's where we find our provision, it's where we find our protection. And then lastly, we've seen an invasion, God's instruction, an illustration, lost influence, and then the impact. And the inhabitant of this territory will say in the day, surely such is our expectation. Wherever we flee for help to be delivered from the king of Assyria, and how shall we escape? Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, Nazi Germany, communist countries, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, they're all seeking the death of Israel. They're all seeking, at one point in history, or currently, seeking the destruction of Israel. And the inhabitant of this ter territory will say in the day, surely such is our expectation. Wherever we flee for help to be delivered from the king of Assyria, and how shall we escape? Depend upon God. Depend upon God. How, how do we escape from sin? Because again, that's that which there is no human escape from. It's been God. And just as truly as God has provided for Israel, God's wanted us to see that illustration so that in the time of trouble, we in turn would depend upon him and him alone. Ezekiel 33, 11 Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked would turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? Now, Isaiah understood that this God was a God of Israel, and this God desired to keep Israel. Why would he walk around for three years without any clothes on? Because, number one, God told him to. Number two, he believed in the message. Because of that, there was no shame. What has God asked us to do? He hasn't asked us to do anything such as this. Isaiah exhibited great faith in doing that. Because all God has asked you to do is to go forth and make disciples. And have no shame in that. To be able to get over yourself and to be able to humble yourself before a mighty God and to go and simply share. To be that witness. To live your Christian life outwardly so that other people would see, other people would hear, and other people would know that Jesus Christ is truly Lord over all. Father, once again, we just thank you for your word that guides us. And Lord, even as Isaiah and so many others did the hard thing and remained faithful to the end, I pray, Lord, that we would receive their example and, and Father, just embrace it. That, Lord, we would get over ourselves, we would get over our shame, we would get over our embarrassment, and that, Lord, we would truly be bold in you. Father, I know that you are looking for boldness in these evil days. Enable us, Father, to be filled with your spirit and to be bold in your word. And so, Father, I lift up those who have come out tonight, that you would bless them, that you would keep them, that you would go before them. I lift up this nation, Father, and I pray that you would allow whatever is necessary for this nation to turn back to you. And as it does, Father... We just pray that you'd be glorified. But, Father, may we not be a people who sit back and wait, but may we be proactive, we pray, in our Christian life, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you all stand, please?